I, if I would have to choose, I would probably choose the uh, technically impressive ones, simply because I don't think that the, you can have a... <clears throat> the, you, you, it's not possible to have too much narrative or concept in a, uh, uh, in, a, in a size coding production. So on a full scale demo, this is completely different, but uh, in a size coding intro or a demo, it's, it's, it's rather a challenge. Um, but that being said, uh, for example, if you look at something like uh, Ilmenit's Thrive or something like that, you can clearly see that there's a story behind the whole thing. Um, but it's also highly technically impressive one, so I don't see why, why we can't have both at the same time. I'm more on the side of narrative and concept ones, um, even when I'm a coder uh, and I can appreciate the technical uh, side of the intros. I believe that uh, we are trying to make some art here and uh, there can be an art in algorithms, but uh, usually uh, they are just reusing the known techniques. So uh, it must be really, really something technically impressive to, to uh, cover the, this site. Yeah, I prefer intros that, that tell a story. Uh, the problem is, you know, anything less than 256 bytes, that's really hard to do. Uh, you know, so I do that with my larger intros, but it's a little harder with size coding. I think I would choose narrative for sure. Even though most of what I write and most of what I'm interested in is the technically impressive stuff, but the I think that the technically impressive stuff I think is actually really lower hanging fruit. <laughs> Um, I think it's incredibly hard to convey a narrative in a tiny intro um, that has emotional impact, you know? And uh, when it's done, it's amazing. It's, it, it's, it, it's, it's just so hard to do. It's so, so hard to do. And for me, I find it a lot easier to focus on technical achievements um, because that's something tangible and measurable. Whereas the emotional impact or the how clearly the narrative is conveyed through your tiny intro is something that you can't quantify. Um, so it's really impossible to know what that connection is going to be like until you actually show it to other people, until you actually release it. I think I would always go for the narrative concept, as I said before. The technical things, I mean, they're really cool to watch if you're a coder, but in generally, if something that catches your emotion or you something more than just a nice triangle, whatever, then I would always go for that. Because I'm like more known for creating technical stuff, I would prefer um, people to to do tiny intros with a narrative or a concept because this is uh, what we need most in a tiny intro scene because people outside the tiny intro scene like in the demo scene I think are more or less aware of the techniques which are possible but um, combining these techniques into something great with a story is something they would rather not expect and be more surprised I guess so if a great intro comes along and I would have to choose which category of these both they are it is, I mean, then it would be the tiny intro with narrative and a concept. If they both look good, I would probably pick the one that makes me wonder how is he even doing it? So I'm probably leaning towards the technical side, but uh, it's not a hard rule, of course. So whatever looks good. The intros that I enjoy the most are usually the ones where I don't know how it was done. And that usually comes from the technical side. I think I'll have to go for the technical achievement, really. Even when I've done the narrative-based intros like Kasharadon Minor, the Baby Shark intro, I've always approached those as a technical exercise. Of, yeah, how can I best represent this story within the technical constraints? I think. Uh, if, if you're not approaching it from that sort of technical angle, 
I think uh, an intro is going to end up sort of pretty basic and shallow, really. This is not a question for me. The technical aspect is the most important. Often intros demonstrate technical tricks, complex and beautiful effects done with a tiny code. However, uh, one doesn't interfere with the other. It's great when a technically perfect intro delivers an idea, when all effects play well together, create a certain atmosphere and carry a message, and not when it's just a bunch of effects. It's a hard question, actually. I think I mostly prefer technical intros simply because it's hard to to push through a concept or a story at these small sizes. On the other hand, when someone really does deliver something that works, that's exciting as well. I personally prefer the technical impressive ones. And why not both? Having a concept and a narrative also means um, spending code on it which also means you have to find ways to get everything together with all what you are showing. And um, this can be very impressive. I'm thinking, for example, of uh, Immediate Railways by Digimind. But you can also just do something technically impressive, which means you show some effect. There's no build up, there's no ending, there's no progress or maybe a little progress by changing some parameters, but there are no surprises anymore. And this might be the missing part about the technically advanced intro. But uh, in the end, both are very complex things to do. I guess I'm certainly a little bit guilty of that myself. I have done far too many tunnels. And obviously when you're starting out, you mostly go with effects that you know. And it can be interesting to show that you can do whatever, a tunnel in 64 bytes. And then maybe, who knows, maybe someone can tune a tunnel in 32 bytes. But, yeah, I mean, at some point you maybe start to explore other things or maybe just the limitations of the smaller sizes guide you into trying other things. But in general, I guess it's not really harder or easier to come up with new ideas and at smaller sizes. I think perhaps the kind of limitations you're under with size coding don't lend themselves so well to creating totally new kinds of effect. If you look at the sort of constraints of an old school platform, which might be being unable to put certain colors next to each other or not being able to uniquely update the whole of the screen in one one go, so you have to creatively sort of repeat the certain bits of pattern. That's the sort of limitation that might inspire new kinds of effect um, to uh, make use of what you've got. I think with size coding, you don't get that so much um, because compared to a full size production, you're still basically painting the same pixels. You just have less breathing room to do it in. So I think with size coding, you're probably better off treating effects as your building blocks and focusing on executing them particularly well, combining them in interesting ways, or to use those effects as the basis of a deeper artistic statement. I would totally agree to that because it's really the, from the hardest thing to get a real new idea, not to re-implement something old. I mean, basically all the effects have been done at some point in history to create something totally new is almost impossible so it's always the idea or the difference to the past ideas that 
make it interesting? I think it is hard, especially since most complex effects need several stages, uh, and that's mostly not fitting the size limit. I actually really enjoy coming up with new effects for tiny intros, um, but I think the problem is that most simple ideas have been explored by someone already, um, and therefore are not new. Uh, so it takes a lot of digging to find new ideas to play with, um, and sometimes recombining old ideas can yield interesting results as well. Well, I don't think that it's very hard to come up with something new, uh, but it might take a lot of time to come, get there. And um, also uh, getting some well-known effect into a smaller size category is a feat in itself. It can actually, sometimes some of the traditional ones can be hard to fit, especially on, say, the Apple II. A lot, a lot of the traditional demo effects use things like palette swapping and sprites and um, scrolling and all that I don't have. So it's actually really hard to adapt the more common ones to it. And so often I, I come up with sort of different things just because it's so hard to do the more traditional ones. It's very hard to come with a brand new effect. First of all, because it's size coded and second, because if you imagine like um, having a semantic map of effects which are um, doable in, in sizes, we even have kind of an expectation right now in certain categories of 32 bytes or 64 or 128, 256, because we we know what's possible. For example, like um, for example, fractals, like iterative fun uh, function systems. So you can do a lot with these functions, but the whole category in, in itself is like unbeatable in a specific area of size scoring, let's say 32 bytes. So you cannot do more than that or, for example, um, cellular layer automatons in 32 bytes. Or recently we had something like, um, it's not really recasting, it's like having a layer and deciding if you stay in that layer or go to the next one, which seems to be far more far away. So like that's a, a mixture of 2D and 3D, I would say, but this kind of uh, parallax effects. So. It's hard to imagine that somebody comes with a complete new category of that because mostly what we do is we improve on these effects, but we don't invent new effects. It's really hard to come up with new effects because some effects are just a really good value for the bytes invested and some are just a really good fit for the machine. There's also the real time constraint and no pre-computation space. So you usually use what uh, what's been tried in bigger intros and try to cram it in? Uh, I believe it's very hard. And, um, and whenever somebody is doing it, uh, it's immediately something that is catching attention of, uh, of everyone. Uh, like happened uh, with last year with uh, MEMS intro, for example, which was uh, something uh, quite new and not often used this fractal and uh, well uh, creation of this um, uh, this this the patterns this way perhaps yes but when you are in the creative flow it's easy to do it often new effects are the result of experiments with algorithms and code how often does one come up with something that's uh... 100% original, maybe once or twice a lifetime. So I think it's usually about taking an idea that's already out there and uh, improving on it, or maybe porting the effect to a different platform or giving it a new twist. That can be an achievement in its own right. But coming up with something completely original is, is of course hard, uh, but it feels great when it happens. I think for newcomers, it's easier to come up with something new, something fresh. After making 50 intros, for me, it's really not easy to bring something to show dropping. Obviously, the question is if it's hard to come up with a good new effect, because I guess that there's plenty of bad 
effects out there. And yes, it is hard to come up with a really good new effect, uh, given that tunnels still win combos. So I think uh, it becomes a little bit easier if one starts thinking about effects as just specific uh, examples from a generic family of effects. So tunnels come from the group of effects that map screen coordinates to UV coordinates, and fire effect is a blur with a particle and kernel, and water effect is solving the 2D wave equation by using simple first order approximation for the spatial and time derivative, etc., etc., etc. And then it becomes rather easy to think, hmm, if, if, if the water effect is a like a 2D wave equation, could I solve some other partial differential equation instead of the wave equation? And who knows, maybe this can lead to discovering new reaction diffusion type effects or slime of simulations or something like that. If I have to select one, that would be Digimind. Uh, and why? Because of his creativity and uh, because he is trying to do uh, with each intro something new and uh, never seen before. And that's, that's what I really appreciate. Hellmoon is obviously a very popular size coder and is incredibly talented, and I, I love his stuff. And I really love the amount of effort he puts into his research. Um, I don't know, I don't think I know anyone who's disassembled more tiny intros than Helmut. I mean, it's it's just insane. Like, the, I, I, every time I have released a tiny intro in the last 10 years, Helmut has gotten back to me in a week with a smaller version of it that he, like, because he disassembled it and found a smaller way to do it. Like, it is, it's just remarkable. Like, the, the level of dedication blows my mind. Um, my other favorite uh, size coder is uh, Sense Install, because I think he, there are so few size coders who are so focused on doing narrative productions, and uh, I think he does it really well, and I think... Uh, I think a lot of size coders could learn a lot from how he approaches what we do. There are a lot of talented guys and it's difficult to pick one, but I will still name a couple. Rola, a man who never ceases to amaze with his effects and tricks, including 3D too. Helmut is the master of optimization and creating the teeniest intros. It seems uh, that he has a special love for 64 byte and smaller intros. I think that's an easy one. Uh, this is uh, Rola. And the first reason is because I'm in the tiny intro scene because of him, because of his uh, pulse intro. And second reason is because of many very good size coders, he is uh, one who is active again, which is a good reason to name him as his uh, favorite size coder. And third, because um, he left a lot of um, footprints, which people are not really aware of in, in many tiny categories, like 32 bytes or 64, even 128 as of recently. So a lot of approaches from what we have uh, answered in question eight, like what effects are there, a lot of approaches have been tried by him and brought to a very tiny size, so that is a good inspiration to improve on and also just to, to see what's there. I think if I picked Jola, he would be probably near the top of almost anyone's list. And uh, from the ZX Spectrum scene, it would be Serge, because uh, he started doing this before it was even cool and nobody was really able to emulate his approach. But of course, there are plenty of talented people out there. Well, I have many favorite size coders, and one of them is Roller, uh, who is one of the few who implemented a lot of very complex algorithms and tiny intros. And also his intro pulse was what got me back into the demo scene and size coin. 
My favorite size coder is Cucumba, who does 6502 and x86 size coding. He's not really that active on the demo scene, but he's well known, especially in the Apple II community, where if you need bytes off your code, he can always find them for you. Uh, often ways that are unexpected or it's not even clear how they work at all. So it's always, uh, uh, he's always been sort of inspiration for how small things can get. Ooh, hard to pick. I have a lot of admiration for SojSoft as uh, one of the pioneers of uh, size coding on the spectrum and just showing just how far you could push just the sheer amount of content in l limited sizes. And uh, also to the fact that he sort of has a distinctive house style of his own. That's, uh, I always really enjoy that. And also um, Rujola, um, who uh, doesn't just sort of execute spectacularly well, but also the, the ways uh, innovating, uh, coming up with new approaches for things. Uh, I'm definitely not an expert in x86, but yeah, it's... Uh, to be able to come up with uh, new techniques for uh, packing and the like uh, with a discipline that's as, as old as uh, size coding is, um, it, it's hard not to be impressed by that. Digimind and Rora are my favorite size coders. Their intros are always unique and different and very strong on technical side. But in personal, Rora is the more inspiring we had so many great discussions at the parties. I think the two most important people for me is still Digimind and Rollar. I think Digimind especially has always very good ideas. He's always coming up with something new, even if it's just once per year. And he's also a very good coder. Then Rollar is, or maybe pronounced it Jola in Czech uh, language. Um, I think he always have the edge on code and like recently he had this SSE packer implemented. I think for the first time an intro used actually a packer for code as a compressor it was very outstanding to me. So those two guys try to meet them in real person. It's always fun to meet them. I, I, I love you all. I, I refuse to pick favorites. Uh, you know, I'm an Apple II expert, but there was, very briefly, an Apple III computer, and it actually has some really interesting features you don't find in the Apple II. It's got a little better graphics, it actually has some scrolling, and you can almost do sort of like a raster bar type effects on it, and so if I had the time, I would do that. The trouble is, I don't have any Apple III hardware, and the emulators are only uh, uh, it's still in progress, so it would be a tricky platform to program for. If I'd look for a new platform, I would uh, look if the CPU has some uh, kind of a very uh, tiny uh, code footprint already, so that I don't need that many bytes to code something. And also, if there are ways to, to get, for example, graphics and sound done with uh, little bytes needed. So DOS is already uh, very efficient in this uh, regard, but Maybe the next platform could be the Mega 65. That would be the Z80. And it's kind of a wrong answer because it's not a new platform. Um, when I was a kid, I coded for the Robotron Z9001. It's an old East German computer, which was actually, I think, a copy, a copycat, uh, like a blueprint stone or whatever. I don't know the exact historic details, but they kind of copied one Z80 processor and named it U80 or whatever. So, and this is a computer I coded on when I was a kid. And now to transform everything I've learned since then, like in the last 40 years or something, uh, back to a system which has this uh, CPU would be, would be on I chose, yes. I would choose the Spectrum. It looks like a really cool little machine with a lot of limitations, but could be fun to code for. And also 
DOS is just too daunting. If I had infinite free time, I would probably go for the whole shader coding, bonzomatic shader toy thing. Right now, I feel I don't have that sort of level of fluency in geometry to be able to say, OK, I've got an array pointing in that direction that corresponds to these particular vector operations. I think that's the sort of thing I could acquire given enough time and patience. But I think you've got to choose your battles and... Uh, I'm content at this point to let other people be the experts in that. Since instead I think I would go for the Atari VCS. I think the fact that it's kind of not really got video memory makes it of interesting interesting and unique enough. Um, it's a sort, sort of uh, self-contained um, puzzle with um, sort of well-defined parameters that I could probably enjoy solving those problems and uh, writing effects on that uh, from first principles. So yeah, Atari VCS, I think. I'm not too much interested in this old school, super old school platform. So I would maybe if these risk five or what is it called risk V development boards come up more in the future would be interesting for me to at least try. But of course, I don't know if it's possible. What kind of overhead maybe with Linux you would have there to do something, but in general I would always prefer those ARM or RISC cores. This one is actually an easy pick. It would be ARM, and it's been long on my to-do list. If I had to learn a new platform, I would choose ARM. I've already got a Raspberry Pi 400 for that reason. I would probably choose Raspberry Pi Co. Uh, I actually bought one, but I didn't get around testing it yet. It's kind of nice to think that it's bare bones enough that you need to decide things like how frame buffers, uh, what kind of frame buffers you use and so on such. But yet there's probably enough computing power to pull up pretty crazy stuff like uh, <clears throat> ray tracing and, 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 and advanced audio and stuff like that. Also, it's a cheap machine, so you can get it easily, unlike some of the retro stuff. So me doing Amiga or C C64 would be basically me doing emulators. I would really like to try a platform where you have a gradual descent from high-level code all the way down to assembly, from high-level graphic primitives like Bezier, patches, all the way down to direct buffer access and playing audio and music all the way down to signal processing. But I don't think such a platform exists right now. I don't know, my next platform is probably going to be like one of those ridiculous vape batteries with the little LCD screens. I want to write a demo for one of those. I don't think it's that important. I guess most intros do it for the, uh, oh, it has sounds thump. I believe that audio is a big part of the experience you can provide the viewers. And it's a shame that under DOS, uh, playing audio has a really high overhead, so you have to sacrifice your effect to have something that sounds good. If you check the biggest high-end tiny competitions, you will see the winner intro usually had no sound. In that 256 bytes intro, which has best visual effect, there is not enough room for music. Audio is important. I think the demos, the tiny demos that manage to fit audio, it really improves things. Uh, again, I'm warped a bit by being on the Apple II where it's really hard to get any sort of audio at all, let alone in, in a tiny demo. So it's really hard to compete with the platforms with better audio hardware. Again, it doesn't mean I won't try though. I think it's not like super important, but uh, if there's an opportunity to add a bit of sound, it's certainly better than nothing. It doesn't even have to be anything complex. But personally, I would only do it if I was confident that it's not at the expense of what I'm trying to achieve with the visuals. I think it's very important and it's not um, researched. Um, enough like um, there was uh, this e 
Ibukun, Ikubun, or or somehow from from <sighs> Provot and uh, Frag, I think, which is uh, already outstanding. But we need more of these. Like I think people are kind of tired um, of the normal MIDI stuff going on, and they are also tired of having to block their ears from from weird noises from the speakers. So it has to be actual music, and uh, it's definitely possible. Like um, I, I don't like to always self-reference me, but. <laughs> You can have like melodies on 32 bytes already with just sending some frequencies to the speaker, which doesn't sound too bad for the ears. And you can go polyphonic in, I think, 64 bytes or something. So in the categories 256 or even 512, I think really good sounding music is possible. And we should focus more on that now that we have like established a lot of effects and effect categories to just, you know, go for uh, how does a snare sound, um, how does a really good bass kick sound, how can we uh, simulate um, instruments and stuff like that. Can be very important depending on the product, but also when you look at the highest rated products on Puet, it's also not needed at all. I mean, if there's a really cool code, nobody code or visuals without sound nobody expects to have some super audio track there and especially not those two note melody crap that something nobody needs it depends it can add a lot to it to the point of being almost essential or it can be just completely disconnected from the visuals and probably waste of bytes a case in point try watching line rider without audio you know, the effect looks bland and does not evoke too much any feelings, but then turn on the audio and the experience, the, the, all these tiny pixels suddenly transform into these Tron light bikes racing on the screen. So, for example, Line Rider is a great, uh, Line Rider is a great example of a tiny production where the absolute audio was absolutely necessary, I think. I'd say audio is definitely not essential. I've done intros where the audio is a key part of the concept and others where it's very much an afterthought. And I think the ones with audio tend to get a better reception than the silent ones, but even then it's not really something that I make a point of including. I don't feel like I have to budget so many bytes to audio or the whole thing is a write-off. Um, obviously, if you do to get everything you set out to do on the visual side with 20, 30 bytes to spare, then adding audio is often a good choice, maybe even the lazy choice, because uh, it's the one thing where you know you can just add that and it's its own standalone thing. You're not having to dial back any of the work that you've already done. Um, but yeah, equally, if you don't have any bytes free, then I, I think, yeah, I don't feel that that will be any less of an intro. So yeah, whatever works. Of course, I think sound is important. It's like comparing an old silent movie with modern cinematography. Another issue is uh, what there is often not enough space in the code for a good sound and many size codons sacrifice sound for additional visual effect. Audio, or better, um, music, is very important, I think. Uh, it's not a must, but uh, if you can do it, uh, you should try, because it makes it a bit more interesting, at least. And it also can add some emotions to it, uh, or some kind of scenery. I don't consider audio to be too important. But oftentimes it does add something if it's there, even if it's not great audio. I'm a little bit torn about that. I, I don't really like to add audio to my own productions simply because I'm never satisfied by the audio I manage to do. But then, there are a lot of productions where the audio does add quite a bit 
to the overall experience? I think it's very important because uh, in case of Demosyn, we have just a few senses we can uh, impact. So it's uh, basically the, the visual side or audio side. And um, audio is uh, often more important than the visuals uh, for making the uh, impression and setting the mood. So uh, whenever there is an audio, it's, uh, I think, just improving the quality well until the the audio is very bad but uh, I, i'm a big fan of having shows with audio effects or music i you know i don't think any one thing is important for a tiny intro i think that you know anything that you can point at and say this thing needs to be in a tiny intro uh Someone can make a cool tiny intro without it, you know? Um, just like there are tiny intros that are procedural graphics, so there's no motion. There are tiny intros that are procedural music, so there's no graphics. There are tiny intros with no music that are just visuals. And there are tiny intros with all of these things. Um, and I'm sure there are tiny intros that are done in media that I don't even know about, that I've never seen. Um, so, and I don't think that choosing one media over the other, or choosing multimedia, or I don't think it necessarily diminishes the quality of the tiny intro um, to exclude or include a specific medium. Um, but I do think that it changes how you can approach what you're doing. Um, so, for example, I think that, you know, I would rather see a tiny intro with no audio than a tiny intro with audio that doesn't contribute to the visuals, for example. Um, but that being said, when the audio does contribute to the visuals, I think that um, it can be a really powerful effect. So, uh, in short, um, I think that audio is has the potential to harm or benefit a tiny intro. Oh, yes, totally, it's possible. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, these two pixels having an, uh, a story like meeting and uh, departing. Also, there's a <clears throat> the other like <laughs> the the small dick whatever pixel dick or whatever uh, intro that has been a narrative and also um, I think one of my intros the, the last terminal uh, intro had a narrative which I think I got across uh, quite quite well. I think it's totally doable in small size categories to tell a story, but it's also something we should focus more on to, to get a story across, to get emotions across, not just the effects. But I would be the wrong guy to, to ask for this because I'm a technical guy. I've seen intros that had a narrative, so it's a definite yes. You definitely can. The question is how much of a narrative you can fit alongside a nice effect. Or whether you have to sacrifice the effect for the narrative. One simple trick is just to put most of the narrative into the title of the intro. Because that's uh, not counting towards the size. If you are flexible on the term narrative, then yes. Depending on the definition of small and narrative here, but I generally think that yes, it, it is. For example, Helmut's Kevin's Nightmare, especially when taken with, with the title, clearly evokes certain ominous feelings, despite being only 32 bytes. And at 128 bytes, Ionix on the road uh, even, more, even more clearly tells a short visual story. So, yeah, I think. And, and, and definitely in 256 bytes, I mean, you know, then we are seeing something like Irmenis Thrive and so on. 
Yes, I think it's possible, and there were examples of it, like with this life of a pixel, I think. Uh, uh, but still, it's not that used. Um, and um, I think for the narrative, you don't need always to have some entities behaving, but sometimes it can be just uh, something uh, some, something uh, um, well, that will bring uh, a scene from uh, real life. And there were intros of this uh, moon landing, there was intro of the um, car going uh, with the lights through the road, there, but there can be also intros of this uh, herd uh, uh, beeping um, from the ZX Spectrum last year. And that's also a kind of narrative that is uh, making some um, emotional impression. Is it possible to tell a narrative in small size categories? Yeah, yeah, I think it is, but it doesn't mean it's easy. Everything is possible in art, especially in size coding. Periodically, there are interests that blow your mind, leaving the question, how, how did you do that, god damn it? So, no problem. Mm, it probably is possible to some extent, but personally I don't see it as a holy grail, because even if we look at some bigger works, unless it's executed flawlessly, it can actually detract from the demo. But. Uh, there are some works, especially on 8-bit computers, uh, that exploit like uh, lofi 8-bit aesthetics and they make good use of humor. So this is one example where it works. Oh yes, of course. The grandfather of the storytelling tiny intros is the immediate release by Tejimai. I like it so much including a narrative into a tiny what is i think a still very difficult task but uh, solvable i don't think that it's impossible one example with something happening and some build up is uh, as mentioned before immediate railways and there are other examples and i think it is possible but you have to find some trade-offs so not to make the different parts of the story too simplistic or uh, uninteresting or boring and still have the crowd uh, impressed and also um, liking the production. Yes, it's definitely possible to do narratives in tiny intros. I think there were a couple of uh, of, of intros released uh, uh, in uh, 2010 in a, within a couple of months of each other as uh, uh, the true story from the life of a lonely cell by Screw and Treepcraft and Dramatic Pixels by PWP uh, which are sort of very much uh, narratives uh, done in a minimal style um, if you're willing to be a bit more open-minded about what counts as a narrative rather than just a progression then maybe something like A Mind is Born by LFT uh, maybe even Baby Shark counts as a narrative. Um, I think maybe what's a more interesting question uh, would be uh, whether it's possible to algorithmically generate a narrative in the same way that you can uh, algorithmically generate music. I absolutely do. I mean, there's many intros that, even with the title and some visuals, make you go into some other world experience at least for me yeah it's definitely possible to tell a narrative in small size categories um there are a lot of great examples uh i won't enumerate them here um but i have seen entire little like stories like literal stories told in in size good before um the life of a lonely cell comes to mind for example, uh, which is obviously not a, which is a, a great example of a tiny intro that sacrifices all sense of aesthetic achievement. It's a literal block moving around the screen, um, but is pure narrative, right? I mean, it's just enough graphics to convey the narrative. That's all it is. And I think 
it, I think that's brilliant. I think that's great. Right? That's what I love to see. So yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, and I think there's there's plenty of room for narrative in Tiny Interest. Beside the online events, IRL size coding events would be a great achievement, I'm sure. Most people in North America don't know anything about it at all. Uh, so I think that there's a lot of room for outreach here, um, a tremendous amount of room for outreach here. Um, and. As far as uh, what can be done, um... I don't have any good ideas for that. Uh, I think having Love Bite is a good start. Attracting new young blood is not an easy task. Demo scene is not pragmatic art. It does not earn your money, uh, and size coding in particular does not develop skills required for real work. At the same time, it takes a lot of time and effort. The demo scene is very addictive, like a drug. It's like fishing or football. How to get people interest in fishing? Show them what a big fish you can cut and what a delicious dish you cook it. That is uh, to show cool interest and demos. Uh, give them a fishing rod, demo tools, so that a person can try it themselves. Go fishing together to a demo party. Let them feel the vibe. I believe the best way is to make something so awesome that people just can't ignore it and make all the promotion for you. Um, so just like with Demosin, uh, I think uh, size coding is deserving a bit more attention from the mainstream art and uh, whenever we could uh, do something more to popularize it and not only in the internet on YouTube or in some streaming platforms but uh, reaching the uh, uh, non-virtual environment it's something that uh, uh, would be great greatly appreciated. Uh, so maybe some exposition in a modern art museum, that would be something very interesting to see. Well, there's probably other coder communities out there who might be deeply interested in the stuff size coders do. So Twitter, JS, tiny JavaScript challenges, computer graphics compression, maybe reaching these kinds of communities is the most natural way for outreach and building bridges. First of all, I'm happy that uh, recently there's been a lot of effort towards information sharing, so the learning curve doesn't have to be so steep. But uh, I think we are not making it really easy for people to run our programs, right? Because we are basically stuck uh, in old platforms and in old operating systems. so. Maybe we could be more open-minded and uh, occasionally try also something new. I think um, that traditional um, computer journals are a way to uh, reach more people by placing some articles there. And uh, another way would be to uh, get covered in Twitch channels or uh, YouTube channels outside of the demo scene, so to show them what the uh, thing behind science coding is and why, it, uh, why it's interesting to watch it. And of course, uh, narratives, uh, music, graphics and so in combination could help here. We are kind of doing the outreach. Um, we are active on, on the science coding uh, Discord. We have our Wikipedia, our size coding wiki, and we are also active in other 
this code like uh, the demo scene itself or we are from Pruitt. What can we do more than that? It's a good question, like um, attend to parties, uh, spread the word, uh, do productions, um, answering questions uh, <laughs> for the love bite. 